Today, I'm going to share with you three secrets that you must know if you want to crush live poker tournaments. Live poker is back and it's bigger than ever. It's better than ever. The games are going off right now, today. The fields are bigger than they've ever been, especially in these small and medium stakes live games. And I want to make sure you have a big edge in those. So in this webinar, you will learn three secrets. First, the preflop mistakes that you will commonly see other players making and how to take advantage of them. You'll also learn various preflop tricks and strategies to help you consistently build a big stack to give you the best chance of winning. And third, we're gonna be discussing short stack strategies and final table strategies that most players in small stakes games simply do not implement and it results in them leaving a ton of money on the table. So secret number one is that tight players min cash tournaments very often, but the aggressive players are the ones who win it. It's important to realize that cashing is not the goal. A lot of people feel like they've had some gigantic success when they cash in a tournament, but most of the money goes to the players who win. Let's take a look at the 2021 World Series Booker main event payout really quickly. A minimum cash paid $15,000. You buy in for 10, you get back 15. A lot of people are happy, they celebrate, they clap and cheer when the bubble breaks. But in reality, they only made 5,000 bucks. Notice, if you take 50th place out of the 8,000 or however many people it is who played, you get 136,000. Actually a pretty good return, 13 times your buy-in. Notice though, if you just outlast 80% of that field, you get a million dollars, a gigantic return, 100 times your buy-in return. And if you win, you get 800 buy-ins. It's important to realize 0.5 buy-ins profit is not very much. 799 is a lot. Your goal should not be to minimum cash. So you need to play more aggressively if you want to win poker tournaments. And you do this by stealing pots that do not belong to you. The alternative that a lot of people do is they just slowly chip down and they hope to run into a setup scenario. But that just doesn't happen most of the time. So you need to increase your preflop three betting frequency. You need to re-raise more often. If you find that you often just call raises and try to flop well, that's gonna result in you having to make hands in order to win. And again, you just don't make that many hands in poker tournaments. You need to be winning the pots where both players miss, which is what will happen if you play aggressively by re-raising before the flop. Also, you need to play your draws aggressively post-flop. So many players just check it down and try to hit because they don't want to invest a lot of money without a made hand or they don't want to get check raise off of their equity. But you're going to find that usually players aren't check raising you left and right and trying to blast their money in the pot. Most players are also playing kind of cautiously. So that allows you to play your draws aggressively so that you pick up a lot of pots where both player or where your opponent does not have a premium hand. And also you want to make sure that you are fighting hard and defending your big blind well. A lot of players just play way too tightly and passively from the big blind because they're out of position. And I realize playing out of position is difficult, but you also have to realize when your opponent min raises before the flop and there's an ante in play, you're getting really, really, really good pot odds. So you can't go around folding hands that are anywhere near decent. Let's take a look at a few examples. In this scenario, we're playing 40 big blinds deep, facing a raise from the hijack. We're on the button with the king 10 offsuit. This is a spot where your only option that makes a whole lot of sense is to re-raise, is to three bet. If you call, what's very often gonna happen is the big blind's gonna call as well, and then we're playing a hand that's sometimes gonna be dominated, sometimes not, but as more and more players see the flop, someone's likely to make a decently strong hand. And if it's not you, it's probably one of your opponents. And the King 10 doesn't even make all that strong of hands. So this is a spot where you should be three betting the vast majority of the time. And that is exactly what we do. There's a raise to 1100, we make it about three times that amount, 3,300. Notice this is gonna make both the blinds fold a large chunk of the time. We're gonna get called or folded uh, by the initial raiser. If they fold, that's great. If they call, when they miss the flop, they're usually just gonna check fold. If they do re-raise before the flop, if they four bet, 
We fold. It's okay. We don't have a good hand. This is a bluff. A lot of players make the blunder of literally never bluffing. And that makes them really, really easy to play against. And like I said, it forces them to get run into setup spots where they just happen to have their opponent coolered. And that does not happen all that often. So usually what's going to happen is the hijack's going to fold or they're going to call. And when they do call, most of the time they're going to check fold to a flop continuation bet. Flop comes queen, six, four. The hijack checks. Take a second. Think about what you should do in this spot. Always consider that. Feel free to type it in the comment section below if you feel inclined. This is a spot where we should definitely make a bet, and we should definitely bet on the small side. Notice, only 2,000 into the 7,900 pot. Remember, our preflop three bet was to 3,300. Now we're betting tiny. You may say, why are we betting so small here? Well, it's because we have a big range advantage. We have, in our range, aces, kings, queens, ace, queen, king, queen, right? These are all very, very strong hands. We're happy to play for all of our money. And our opponent probably does not have a whole lot of aces, kings, queens, and ace-queen because quite often they would just four bet those before the flop. So that makes our range just generally stronger than our opponent's range. And even when we do have some junk like this in our range, it's okay because if we do bet this and get check raised, we easily fold. So we go for the small bet and the opponent just folds. You will be surprised perhaps to find that people will fold to small bets. If you give this player any unpaired hand, they're probably just going to fold due to being out of position and due to not having anything, and due to our range being decently strong. Now, if they do have a pair, they're probably not going to fold, and that's okay. We will find that we are able to barrel the turn sometimes whenever we get a draw. Sometimes we're going to make a king or a 10 that's good, and, you know, sometimes we lose. Sometimes when you do three bet before the flop with nothing, and you don't make a good hand, you're going to lose, and that is okay. But notice we're not actually risking all that many chips here. This is a very, very cheap bluff. If your bluffs are very cheap, when they fail, it doesn't even matter all that much because you're giving yourself a really good price to try to steal the pot. Let's take a look at another hand. We have the king, ten of spades. We raise it up, playing pretty deep stacked. Big blind calls. Flop comes queen, nine, six. The opponent checks. This is another spot where I think we have a pretty easy bet. And to be fair, if we bet this one and get raised, we should probably actually call, unless the opponent makes it too big, to try to spike a jack. Because when we're very deep stacked, when we do spike that jack, we are highly likely to get paid off if the opponent does have a queen or better, which they will often have when they check raise the flop. So we're going to go for a bet in this spot. Notice this board is a little bit more coordinated than the previous board, so we're going to use a bigger bet size. Also, we are deeper stacked, so we're going to use a bigger bet size. I discussed this thoroughly in my tournament masterclass at pokercoaching.com. Make sure you check that out if you want to understand when to bet and how much. So we do bet. The opponent calls. Turn is a spade. Opponent checks. This is an excellent spot to apply immense pressure with our best made hands that are vulnerable to being outdrawn, like king-queen. That's a hand that's almost always good, but it's very susceptible to being outdrawn. Also, some of our very high equity draws, like flush draws with straight draws, which is what we have here. And then also with a few total bluffs. Not all that many, but a few total bluffs with random stuff like king high or a gut shot. And then we're going to check everything else, like our middle pairs and um, bad queens, ace high, stuff like that. Stuff that can conceivably win when it goes check, check, turn, check, check, river. So we're going to bet, and we're going to bet big in the spot, as I would like to do with a hand like king queen. We go for pot. This is a spot where a lot of players fear betting this big because they really, really, really do not want to get raised all in, which I agree. You don't want to get raised all in. But you have to realize that our range is very, very strong when we bet here because I just told you some hands like king, queen, and better that are pretty happy to get all the money in. You may say, if I do get check raised, am I really putting my money in with a hand like king, queen? I think when the board is this draw heavy, I think you usually should unless you know your opponent's very weak and tight and passive and straightforward. If that's the case, you can bet big. And if they call you, you almost always have the best hand. And if they fold, that's fine, because whatever they had usually has some equity. And if they do check raise, you actually can fold against weak, tight, passive players because they're not going to check raise with a hand worse than a hand like king, queen. But in order to make a fold, you have to know your opponent very well. We do bet big here, and the opponent just uh, lets it go. And if they do decide to call, we will be bluffing the river some portion of the time when we miss. A big mistake a lot of players make is they bet the flop with a draw, they bet the turn with a draw, they miss the river, they're sitting there with king high or jack high or eight high, and they just give up. And that is usually going to be a mistake because you have to realize that you would like to shove the river for value with hands like king, queen, and better, which means you need to work in some bluffs. 
So, don't be a net. Don't be afraid. Secret number two. If you want to have a huge edge in tournament poker, you need to master short stack strategy because that is a stack depth that you will very often be playing, especially in small stakes tournaments or turbo tournaments or tournaments online. I realize we're talking about live poker to some extent today, but you want to make sure that you know how to play short stacked well because if you do not, you're going to be making blunders left and right. I'm going to show you two spots that a lot of people screw up. Let's take a look at this chart here first. Let's focus on this one. This is our 12 big blind strategy when it folds to us in the low jack seat. This is our raise first in strategy. The low jack, low jack seat is under the gun if we were six handed. So kind of like middle position at a full table. This is a spot where a lot of players pull up a push fold app and just follow the push fold app. But that is a blunder. If you use a push fold app when you have more than something like eight big blinds, you are messing up and torching your bankroll. Please don't torch your bankroll, okay? Here is the Game Theory Optimal Strategy. You can find this using the Poker Coaching app. We also have these charts on our website that are very easy to search. And as you see here, the hands in light red are hands that are min-raised. All the best hands are happy to min-raise because you don't really care what odds you give your opponent because they're really, really good. And then by min-raising all of our nuts that can easily call a shove, we also get to min-raise some hands that are bluffs, hands that are not quite good enough to open shove all in. If you look at a push fold chart, you'll find that some of these hands in this vicinity on the cusp of playability, these in this area, hands like in this area, are perhaps not quite good enough to open shove. But if you min-raise with the best hands, that allows you to use some of these hands as bluffs. And this essentially allows you to play a wider range profitably. So when you use a shove or fold only strategy, you have to play fewer hands than whenever you use a min-raise or shove strategy. And that results in you just making less money when you shove or fold only. And if you make less money across the board than your good opponents, well, you're gonna lose. The hands in dark red are still open shoved. That is worth noting. Some players just min-raise everything in this spot, which is also a mistake. Pre-flop spots are very, very easy to get the accurate data on. It's just important to realize that we are playing No Limit Texas Hold'em, which means you have all the options at your disposal. Now, perhaps we could even add a limping strategy here, but you'll find that that does not actually increase your equity all that much at all. It's like minuscule. But there is a pretty big difference between using an all-in or fold strategy compared to an all-in min-raise or fold strategy. So don't screw this spot up. Make sure you use good strategies. Another spot that a lot of people mess up is in the small blind versus a button min raise. 20 big blinds deep. So the button min raises, it's on us in the small blind. All the hands in red shove, all the hands in green call, all the hands in blue fold. Now, people screw this spot up in all sorts of ways. A lot of players call really wide with stuff like 8-6 uh, suited and 6-4 suited and 4-3 suited trying to flop well. Or they call with a lot of these hands, like pocket sixes or king jack offsuit, trying to flop well. Some players shove or fold everything. But notice there actually is a decently wide calling range in this spot because we are getting pretty good odds. Notice most of the hands that do call are hands that flop reasonably well or hands that can make top pair and get the money in playing 20 big blinds deep. Notice pocket aces opts to flat call because you don't really care if your opponent stays in the pot when you're shallow stacked. The goal is not to pick up the pot when you're playing shallow stack with a hand like aces because your opponent's equity is in the dumpster. Very importantly to note though, most of this range shoves all in. 20 big blinds deep, you should not have much of a flat calling range from the small blind when the button puts in a raise. So you see all these ASX suited and most of the ASX offsuit are open shoving. Notice a lot of the big Broadway hands are open shoving as are the pairs. These are all hands that shove over the button's min raise. I realize it is risky. It feels, it feels risky. It's actually more quote unquote risky to call and then just bleed off your stack. <laughs> but you are gonna go broke sometimes when you shove with a hand like a seven offsuit and they call you. But most of the time they're gonna fold. And uh, the reason a lot of these big cards are shoving like ace x offsuit is because when you have an ace in your hand, you block your opponent's calling range, which means that they're gonna fold to your shove very frequently, which is good because then you just win the pot. So. Make sure you are using optimal short stacked preflop strategies. Again, all of these are available in the Poker Coaching app for Poker Coaching members. So make sure you play the short stack well. Secret number three is that big money is made at the final table. So once you get there, 
make sure you focus on playing well. But in order to play well, you have to make a point to study. And I'm going to share with you a free, uh, two spots that a lot of people screw up. Again, we discussed this earlier where if you min-cash in a tournament, like the main event, you get, well, 1.5 buy-ins. But notice, most of the money is made at the final table, and there's actually a very big difference between ninth place and first place. You need to make sure that you are playing in a manner that gives you a reasonable chance to win in most scenarios. So you're going to find that you need to stay very aggressive. This usually means three betting or jamming over someone's raise. Okay? You need to figure out who is scared of playing for all of their chips. You're going to find that some pros don't really want to play big pots. They just want to play lots of small pots with an edge, and they just want to slowly grind down their opponents, which is kind of the dream world. But if that's what your opponents are trying to do, don't let them do it, right? And especially when you have a big stack against a medium stack, this is a scenario where you can really, really, really lean on your opponents and force them to fold out hands that have very good equity, which, re which will result in a lot of small and medium pots going your direction, which will give you a big chip lead, which will allow you to have your best shot at winning the tournament. Also, you want to make sure that you avoid slightly plus EV, slightly profitable spots, when you have to risk all of your chips. This usually takes the form of not calling off in spots that are roughly flipping, but also... Once we do get in scenarios where there are a lot of payout implications, not necessarily ripping it all in with your entire range. We're going to take a look at this in just a second. You also want to make sure that you are aware of your opponent's tendencies. And you want to make sure that you are understanding who does not care about the payouts and who are playing for the win only. These players uh, are few and far between in today's games, but you definitely will still encounter them. And you want to make sure that you do not battle too hard with them because... They don't care if they take fourth place or second place. They only want to win the tournament. And the thing is, is whenever two players get it all in, roughly flipping in a final table scenario, they both actually lose equity. And that equity goes to the other players sitting at the table because one of those players who gets it in flipping goes broke. The other one gets a lot of chips. But when you double your chip stack, you don't actually double your equity at a final table. You may be 1.8 exit. And that other 0.2 bits of equity, gets distributed to the other players at the table, and, well, that's bad for you. So if your opponent does not care about the payouts, make sure that you do not make a blunder of getting in a flip with them. So let's take a look at some examples here. Here we are at a final table scenario, playing with one big stack and then three relatively shallow stacks. We have a 15 big blind stack under the gun, 17 big blind stack on the button. We have 22. Big blind has 31. Cutoff has 70. Very common spot. Cutoff should be raising incredibly wide here. If you're the cutoff, you want to be raising a lot. I'm not going to say 100% of hands, but a lot. Now, what should we do with this ace jack? First things first, we should actually be pretty tight in this spot because we are highly incentivized in any normal final table scenario to outlast the... 17 and 15 big blind stacks. This would be even more true if there were perhaps shallower stacks. So we're going to be really tight. So a lot of people would just shove this all in. And if there were no payout implications, this would be an obvious all in. But there are going to be payout implications. So this is a spot where the optimal strategy is to actually three bet this hand and then fold it to a shove from the big stack. You may say, but shouldn't the big stack just shove really, really wide if we three bet? And the answer is no, because our three betting range is going to be really, really, really premium here. This is one of the worst hands we are going to be playing in this spot. You cannot be calling and splashing around in this spot. We're going to be three betting most of our hands, and our three bet bluffs are going to be coming mostly from ASEX hands that are not quite good enough to get it all in. And in this scenario, you're actually not happy to get it all in with a hand like Ace Jack, because like I said, if we do shove and get called in this spot, that's really, really bad for us, and the equity is going to be going to the other three shallow stacks, which is really, really bad. So, uh, the only time I would consider shoving the spot is if I thought the cutoff was unaware that I should be really, really tight. If they are completely unaware, if they're just going to rip their stack in, right? If these are the types of players who are just going to pile it in, I suppose I would just rip it all in myself in this scenario. But the game theory optimal play in this scenario is to three bet and then fold if your opponent shoves. But the cutoff who should be opening incredibly wide, remember, 
they are going to fold the vast majority of the time. And if they do call, yeah, it's not great, but they're probably going to be dominated or in pretty bad shape. Let's take a look at another spot. Here we have the big stack at the final table. Notice we have an eight big blind stack, a 20 big blind stack, and then a bunch of 30 to 40 big blind stacks. Okay. This is a scenario where we are going to be raising pretty wide because if the eight big blind stack folds, then everybody else has to be incredibly cautious. They have what's referred to as a big risk premium on them where they really, really, really do not want to go broke before the eight big blind stack. So we raise it up. Big blind calls, flop comes, king, eight, five. This is a good pro who we have to presume is going to be competent. Okay. Good pro checks. We are going to make a continuation bet for a small amount. Pretty standard spot. Um, when you are at the final table, usually as the big stack, you're going to be betting way more often than if there were no payout implications because your opponent has to defend a little bit tighter on all betting rounds. And as more and more money gets into the pot, they have to defend tighter and tighter because, again, they really don't want to go broke before the uh, button here who has eight big blinds. So we bet frequently in small. We're going to bet here with what I have to presume is our entire range. Opponent calls. This is a spot where the opponent should actually not raise very often at all. When you're the medium stack, you really, really, really don't want to get it all in, roughly flipping. And if this player does raise and get it in, we're going to have, what, a good king or better or premium draw, in which case that's really bad for the button. So they have to call a lot. Turns to Jack of Hearts. Not a great card for us, kind of a neutral card, but we should still be betting in the spot very frequently because if the opponent has an eight or a five, we can apply immense pressure and get them to fold. Maybe not on the turn, but almost certainly by the river. So this is a spot where we do load it up. We go 90K. I think if I was playing this hand in game, I'd probably go a little bit smaller, like 75, because I would fear, maybe incorrectly, <laughs> that when we bet 90, that may make our opponent continue only with good draws and a king. Whereas if you bet 75, they're going to call with more hands containing a jack or an eight or a five. And that's fine. I don't care if they stick around with a jack or eight or a five, because I already know I'm going to be ripping it in on the vast majority of rivers. Notice if the river's a spade, if they have even a king, their hand becomes way worse. If the river's not a spade, well, we can get them off of all their flush draws and a uh, pair of plus draws, right? So this is a spot where we are going to be shoving the river the vast majority of the time. Notice we do have about a pot size shove remaining. That's one of the benefits of betting a little bit bigger on the turns. We have roughly a pot size river shove. And the opponent folds. And you may say, what if they call? That would be terrible. Uh, yeah, it would be terrible. <laughs> but very rarely are they actually going to call. And also remember what our range looks like. We open under the gun. We're not going to be raising 100% of hands in this spot, so we have something decent. And if you think about our range, it's going to contain pretty much all the nut hands in this scenario. And our opponent probably does not have all the nut hands, right? And this, this puts them in a really, really nasty spot. So we bet the flop, bet the turn, jam the river with a stone bluff, and we pick up a nice pot. So that is it. Those are the three secrets to crush live poker tournaments. To recap, tight players men cash in tournaments, but aggressive players win. And while there are times where you should play really tightly and try to lock up a men cash, usually when you have no chips for whatever reason, that's not the spot you want to be in. If you consistently find yourself with few or almost no chips approaching the bubble of a tournament, you've probably screwed up. A lot of the best players in the world accumulate a lot of chips on the bubble and a lot of chips at the final table, and that results in them winning the titles more often than not, whereas a lot of players, they just really want to climb up the payout ladder just a little bit more. But remember, the big jumps are at the final table and from first to second to third, right, in that vicinity. So you want to make sure you get there. Also, if you want to have a huge edge in poker tournaments, you must focus on mastering short stack strategy. Please do not think that you're supposed to use just a simple push fold strategy when you have 20 big blinds. If you do that, you're leaving a ton of money on the table and you're going to have a difficult time winning, especially as you play against reasonably competent opponents. And also, tip number three, the big money is made at the final table. So focus on playing a strategy that will result in you getting there and then once you get there, make sure you play well. You do need to study final table strategies. And I have a lot of content at pokercoaching.com going very in-depth explaining how I and a lot of my other coaches play the final table. Because I realize a lot of those spots are perhaps somewhat unintuitive and difficult to master. So make sure you focus on playing well at the final table. That's going to be it for today. If you enjoyed this video, 
do me a quick little favor. Click the like and subscribe button below. I would definitely appreciate that. Also click the notification bell. Good luck in your games. Have a great, great week. If you use any of these secrets to crush your games, come back, leave a comment, and let me know that this helped you out. I'll talk to you next time.